But uh, I I really dig the what's that a tarpon behind you and then a what's right below that a salmon? Yeah, so I've got uh these is kind of like a rope, kind of a rotating wall back here. Um, mm -hmm. I've got yep tarpon up top, brook trout, and then a a tog. Um, and it just the tog sometimes is sweet. Thanks, man. Yeah, well maybe that's uh maybe that's, <laughs> maybe I'll send you one of those guys. All right, man. I'm totally down. That'd be awesome. Yeah, the tog is like. I don't know if if I had a if I had to pick a fish to represent me, I think it would be a tatag. Yeah, yeah. I don't I, know likewise. why. Likewise. <laughs> yeah, we talked about that last time, like just how the tatag is like this perfect representation of someone from New England. You know, that's right. Yeah, They're, the teeth, the teeth have that whole New England look. You know, and yeah, just big gnarly looking thing. <laughs> slimy, yeah. <laughs> slimy little bastards. That's right. Oh man. <laughs> but um. So you're in Colorado right now, right? So you're yep. not in Maine. What was, um, remind me again why you moved there. Yeah. So, um, I could give you a real quick rundown of just my, my whole kind of background with, you know, I, I grew up in Maine on the coast of Maine, um, mm -hmm. about three quarters of the way up the coast and the Bar Harbor area. Mm -hmm. And my folks still live up there, although they are slowly migrating south. Um, like most do. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I, after that, you know, my, my, my kind of number one passion is the ocean. And then I'm also super into mountain biking, grew up skiing. Mm -hmm. Um, I've, I've kind of had a, a lifelong struggle of being torn between the mountains and the ocean and wishing I could have both in the same place, which <laughs> it's harder to find than you think. Um, yeah you know, real mountains and real ocean. It's just kind of hard to combine those two things. Um, right. And yeah, so I, uh, after school, I moved out here to just kind of, um, had a couple like odd jobs out here and I was piecing it together and skiing and mountain biking. And, um, I actually met my wife out here and then the ocean was calling me back pretty hard, even just mm -hmm. after being here for a couple of years. And I was, you know, the, the visits I was doing weren't, weren't enough. Um, yeah. so we ended up moving back. We moved to Portland, Maine and, okay. um, we lived there for, I want to say like four or five years. Mm -hmm. And then the kind of, we got the same pull back to the mountains again. And it's <laughs> tough. Cause like we, we don't really have any family out here, but we have yeah. lots of family on the East coast. So uh, my mom grew up in Rhode Island. Uh, we right in Snug Harbor. Um, oh, that's right. Yeah, about on, yeah. On, so on the salt ponds. That's right. Yeah. So I have a lot of roots there as well. And like every summer growing up, it was that's how I got into diving and a lot of the fishing I do. My dad's a big fisherman down there, and mm -hmm. um, and I, I kind of always I had the access to there, but. Mm -hmm. it, I think we felt like we were lacking the access to the mountains because we didn't really have a presence out here. So we ultimately decided to kind of were experimenting with like spending part of the year here and part yep. of the year there. So, I mean, I think for most of we're hoping we both are fairly mobile with our work. Mm -hmm. my, my wife's uh, works remote and then I can kind of block off my time if I do it efficiently Right. And I can kind of, you know, I, I can go to the East Coast, hit all the East Coast shows, load up. I've got a, tra a trailer here that I can load up with all my inventory mm -hmm. and just drive east, you know. So we plan to spend, you know, a big chunk of the summer and fall um, back in Rhode Island. And, yeah. Uh, but, yeah, so we're trying – we're kind of just trying to, <laughs> no to have both. And it's it's challenging yeah. and it presents its own challenges for sure. But, yeah. Um, it, we're, we're making it work. So, yeah. Well, I, and that's the only thing you can do, right. Is just try and make it work. And cause if you love both things, I mean, that's a perfect combo right there too. Cause if you think about it, you get the ocean in the, the summer and fall, which arguably is like the best time to be out on the water. I even think fall is even better than the 100%. summer sometimes. Right. Yeah. Um, because most of the people who don't really belong on the water or off the water, <laughs> right? They go back to work. Definitely. And then, um, you know, come wintertime, you go back out to Colorado and just ski your heart out and mountain bike come spring. Like, that sounds like a great combo combination to me. Um, you mentioned this whole, like, this this pull, right? Kind of like a, how the moon pulls on the tides, right? And, and it, it's funny because I experienced the same thing. 
you know, and it being close to the water is this wild kind of can't really describe it type of pull to the ocean. You know, I just had this conversation with a buddy of mine yesterday. He's like, he just moved to South Carolina and we actually lived in Hawaii together and, and we've known each other for a while, but he's like, you know, the, the one thing I didn't realize that I would miss is the ocean. You know, he's very inland in South Carolina. And I'm like, yeah, man, I trust me. If I go on a backpacking trip out West for like a week, by the time that week is over, I'm like, I gotta, I gotta go to see some sort of body of water and it's definitely not going to be a lake, you know? So why do you think that is? Like, why do you feel that pull to the ocean? Cause you mentioned in, you know, I know that you, d- you do a lot of spear fishing, boating, fishing, just, you know, you're a waterman, right? So what do you think that pull is for you? Well, you know, I think it's, I think a lot of people experience the kind of mountain ocean pull cause they're both such like dramatically different environments, you know, and mm. they, kind of have like ultimate extremes on different different sides and you know i have it's i think like some there's some crazy statistic like the highest the percentage of of like density of scuba divers live in boulder colorado like there's really i mean they travel to do it you know and there's Mm -hmm. a lot of people doing freshwater diving and stuff but um there's definitely a relationship between the two. And I mean, the ocean will always be kind of my first love because I, I grew up right on the ocean in Maine, Mm -hmm. which is like the coolest ecosystem in itself. I mean, like uh, we'd have, Mm -hmm. you know, Harbor seals coming up and having babies right in front of, you know, giving birth right in front of our house, like literally the cove right there. You could see it from our kitchen. I mean, it was like crazy access. And then, Mm -hmm. um, And then you go down to Rhode Island and it's like a whole different set of species and it's totally Mm -hmm. different. Um, You know, I I grew up surf casting and fishing just, you know, fluke and black sea bass and stuff with Mm -hmm. my dad, uh, my whole childhood. And then I will never forget my, uh, my buddy Will and I were out fishing on the, uh, would have been the West wall right there. Okay. uh, Yeah. Point you right there in East Matunic. Yeah. And, uh, we fished from like noon until the sun was going down Mm -hmm. and we didn't catch anything. I mean, I was never (laughs) that good at it, but we just didn't, you know, we were completely unsuccessful and we, the sun was getting really low. And I looked down as we were packing up our gear, I looked down at the end of the jetty and I see this silhouette Mm -hmm. coming out of the water on the very end of the West wall. And it's like this older guy, total badass gets out i mean especially for like a couple high school kids we were like oh my god what's happening it's like a navy seal coming out of the water or something right um so he comes out of the water and he's got like a stringer and he had like a bunch of tog he had his limit on tog he had Mm -hmm. like a fluke on there and we both just looked at each other and we're like (laughs) we're doing something wrong here like we like whatever he's doing like that's what we need to do (laughs) so we went and chatted him up which uh, for a couple of high school kids it was hard to muster up the courage to do, but we went over and talked to him and this old he, salty I mean, guy. Oh, he was, yeah, he had a big <laughs> gnarly, that gray beard. And he was just like, yeah, one of the, definitely an OG Northeast spear fisherman, <laughs> but he, uh, he kind of gave us the full rundown and we didn't really have any money at the time. So I remember he was kind of like, let your, you know, if you're, if you can't buy the stuff, like you can make all, you know, you can make mm-hmm. a lot of it and, or get it secondhand or whatever. And he was just like, let your kind of creativity run free. So I remember we went to Home Depot and I, my first, my first pole spear was just like a broom handle with a bunch <laughs> of knives. Like I had like uh little steak knives and I cut the tips off. Steal them out of the and, kitchen. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Robbed my mom of all her steak knives and then uh, put them on the end lashed them on there and then had a piece of like surgical tubing yeah and that was my first like that was my first pole spear and then Mm -hmm. um ever since then you know i mean you know how it goes you just kind of every year you you upgrade something else and Mm -hmm. and you know even since then i mean some of the older guys would probably laugh at me saying this but even just since i was a kid it's like crazy how much the technology you know uh wetsuit technology everything's just progressed so much um, yeah so yeah so that i mean 
my big passion for the ocean is definitely my my is fishing diving um and then you know i'm getting into fly fishing out here so i'm i'm kind of trying to like still have that water connection here mm-hmm. just to get me through the part of the year when i'm out here just to get that <laughs> the fish, whistle. But yeah, yeah but it'll never be the ocean you know it'll never, I, i'm always gonna have to get back east for of course a good chunk of time of course and, and the thing i love about the northeast and just the eastern seaboard in general is that it's so dynamic you know depending on where you are it could really i mean you could go 50 to 80 miles offshore and go fish pelagics and then you can come inshore and you know hook up on some black sea bass or go fluking jump in the water do some spear fishing and then go explore a cove or an island you know there's so much to do here on the northeast and in the northeast and especially in new england i mean people might hate me for saying this but i think rhode island and narragansett bay and i'm partial right is probably some of the best boating in new england because i I completely agree i mean you can shoot off to the cape you can go see the vineyard if you want to head up into boston go through the canal you can come down play into the narragansett bay you got the salt ponds i mean there's so much to do here you know and having lived in other places like california and hawaii you know i i loved hawaii hawaii is it's very it's its own thing too but the the only thing i missed was well there's two things i missed was one the seabirds because for some reason there's no seabirds in hawaii um they brought in all these cane they brought well yeah it, it was weird you know i asked this question because the the birds here in new england have always been something i've been inter- interested in um but i found out that basically what had happened was when they brought over sugar cane they'd bring they brought in the cane spiders and the cane toads right and the cane toads they try to get rid of the cane toads because they're destroying the, t- the crop with weasels or i think uh yeah i think they're weasels and then in order to but the weasels didn't actually eat the cane toad. They would go eat all the birds and all and all the nesting eggs, right? So completely destroyed the seabird population in Hawaii. And, um, you know, Hawaii just doesn't have those coves and inlets and, and small places to explore. You're pretty much segregated on this one body of land, which, you know, has its own. If you're a diver, I mean, it's incredible. I, I can't dive because of my ears. I can only go so deep. Um but I mean, it's beautiful nonetheless. But yeah, I think New England, for me at least, is probably some of the best boating and fishing or what have you as a waterman in in the world. I mean, I haven't really gone anywhere else in the world, but <laughs> from the United was, States perspective, you know. Um, I totally agree. You know, you growing up in the salt ponds, clamming, yeah. fishing, just all of this, it, it seems like was kind of a catalyst to then start doing what is now bull coast burns and becoming the artist. But, you know, have you, can you, can you speak a little bit to just you being an artist, right? Because, you know, you could spend all day and night on the water all you want, but then there's this whole side of being creative and, and having this, you know, attention to detail, right? Cause looking at a lot of your pieces, I mean, man, you, you take a tarpon or a tatag and it looks like, you know, something that would be swimming underwater. So, what I think is really cool about the way you have your artwork is, you know, you're not just an artist, you're also a waterman, you know, so you kind of play both cards, but growing up, were you, were you someone that was always into art, always doodling, always drawing, and then eventually doing what is now Bull Coast Burns? Yeah. You know, I grew up, I was so fortunate to grow up in a family that really uh, valued art and kind Mm -hmm. of opened my eyes you know, like it was, my dad's an artist um, okay. and he does really cool, like really large scale abstract, um, like kind of mixed media, but watercolor art. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, he, you know, he was a commercial fisherman for years. He has like his own set of kind of ocean inspiration mm-hmm. um, for his art. And I mean, yeah, I, I, I've, I've been doing art for as long as I can remember. And honestly, most of it, has revolved around fish the whole time. Um, yeah. And, you know, I was doodling when I was a kid. And then when I got to college, I was in school for graphic design. Mm-hmm. And it was like every project that I did, I would try to bring it back to like fishing or the fishing industry. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I mean, it was just like always, no, my screen here is. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, Don't worry about it, man. And 
yeah, I, I would always try to bring it back to the fishing issues. So if we had, the, you know, if we were making a website or something, I would automatically default to like, you know, <laughs> some company in the, you know, some website prototype or some company in the fishing industry or something, just so I get to drop fish or, you know, whatever. Right. I always wanted to bring it back to that. So um, after school, I just kind of, I I wanted to continue doing art, but I didn't want to sit behind a computer constantly. And mm. that's really what you know four years of college did was gear me up for you know countless hours behind the computer um right and don't get me wrong i love i love being behind the computer but i like to mix it up you know and i always love working with my hands and Mm -hmm. um so after school you know i kind of i i fumbled around and kind of did like some odd jobs i worked on an organic farm for a long time i worked at an ice plant i you know, worked on charter boats. I did like all kinds of, all kinds of different jobs, which honestly, I wouldn't give up any of that. Um, and then when we moved back to Maine, so this last period of living in Maine, somebody gifted me a wood burning pen. Um, Mm. and I, after work, it was like, when I thought of wood burning at that point, I just thought of, and this is what a lot of people associate wood burning with. It's, you know, something you do when you're a kid, you know, you get like a little soldering kit, you know, soldering (laughs) iron and you can draw and, and, uh, and then I realized that like wood burning is kind of, I don't know if there's more interest or more kind of money in it, but there's now you can get these super cool wood burning pens with Mm -hmm. all these different heads on them. So you can do different kinds of shading and everything. So I started out after work, I was, I was just hustling. Like I'd put in hours after work of wood burning, just trying to figure this thing out. And I, I just was getting frustrated that every piece I made was like, you know, you just don't see large scale wood burning. There's more of it now, Mm. but like when I was starting to do it, it was every single piece you saw was ultra detailed. And it was like a max of maybe 20 inches wide, you know, it was just like really small. Right small stuff and as a fisherman and a diver i was like i want to see things to scale you know i don't want to see a a a Mm. small you know tarpon that's you know 12 inches long like i want to i want to figure out how to scale this up and make you know large scale pieces so i ended up just kind of yeah researching and and uh i i just kind of went on a rampage buying all of the torches that i could find like (laughs) propane butane um and just started messing around with that you get these really blurry edges but i was getting really cool effects with depth um and i ultimately just kind of compared it to like like a street art kind of it was like almost playing around with airbrushes and like if Mm. you see if if you know any of your listeners get a chance to check out my work it's it's uh it really does have that kind of like street art vibe to it. So it's a Mm -hmm. lot of like shading and um, not ultra detailed stuff, but when you take a step back, you kind of get the the full impact. Um, Yeah. No, I think you're spot on with that. I mean, that was definitely better the way how you described it a lot better than the way I would. I think um, it has that street art effect to it, that vibe, but at the same time, it's more refined, you know, like it's not this, it's not hodgepodge thrown together, right? And and more in so abstract. It's it's an interpretation of a fish that really is something that you know you don't get to see all the time, right? Because a lot of the people when they when you catch a fish, you know either it's a catch and release or or a catch and kill scenario, but you don't actually get to really see the details in the fish, each scale, like how they're all kind of connected to one another and. And, you know, going back to the Tatag, right, the, the, the fish of all fish, the ultimate fish, <laughs> um, the, it's, a, it's an interesting, you know, not many, not many people are doing a Tatag piece, right? Not many people are doing a black sea bass piece. It, it's more of the, the big pelagic. So I think it's cool that you kind of bring in this whole aspect of, you know, it's every fish, right? No matter, right. you know, no matter what it is, right? And, and each fish is special in its own regard and has its own place in the environment. So I really, I really like how you kind of bring those two aspects together while keeping it kind of that street art vibe. And at the same time, kind of refining it to a point where it's like not a, not a 
I wouldn't say anatomy level, or I don't know, would you, would you agree or disagree with that? Cause I think it could quite possibly be that detailed as well. I mean, I try like another thing that I really, because with the wood burns, I'm not working with color. I'm just kind of mm. working with, and, and that's not necessarily true because I do like select certain pieces of wood um, based on their color, you know? So like a maple is going to have like sometimes a more kind of a reddish tone, like, like a mm. slight kind of reddish or darker tone to it. And then yep. like a poplar, which I use a lot. Um, poplar is a much lighter tone and just kind of mm. um you're, you're not like so so you know like maybe for a tarpon i would use a piece of poplar and then for you know uh, a cod like like cod i try to always use like a maple or something with a little like a richer tone to the wood mm -hmm. um and then also you know beyond that i i do really try to focus on scale because air uh you know accuracy i guess in terms of of uh, uh fin sizes and you know just getting you know the right you know you got it like on a striper you know you got it, you still have to capture that same that right that same scale pattern and everything um so there's a balance but they definitely i mean accuracy is another thing that that you know anybody who's into fish in any capacity like if it's not right, they're yeah. going to call you out on it. You know, and it's <laughs> right. like, it's not, right. and, and an artist, you have a lot of, you have, you know, you can kind of do whatever you want, but I prefer to try to keep the fish as close to, as close know, as possible as, as, as they really are. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, 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 I'm, you, you definitely nail it, you know, cause going through your website, seeing your Instagram and seeing some of your pieces, it's like, wow, that's, that's a tarpon you know, like, you know, right off the back like that. And it's so detailed. And I, I just, I, I just love how you kind of incorporate that street arc effect with the anatomy and the, the level of accuracy you go into it all while doing it via a tool that is, is, you know, kind of overlooked, you know, wood burning, right? This is a very interesting way to kind of go about it. So what's kind of been your process when you go from, all right, I got something in my head, or do you use like a photograph or how do you get the the fish onto the piece of wood and, and what types of wood you, you you dove a bit a little bit into that but like what's your process in terms of from start to finish how, how are you making a piece yeah so i mean when i started it was definitely um it was all pen and ink on paper mm -hmm. it was like my you know i'd start with pencil then i'd move into pen and ink and then i was like as, as kind of I started to explore kind of revisit my design past. I would, mm. I would bring them out, you know, I was scanning them in and bringing them into like um, different drawing programs on the computer. And then mm -hmm. I can kind of like, you know, add, add certain things or, you know, edit things on the computer. Um, which now, honestly, the, I have a, a tablet and that has kind of become my, I mean, until it's on the wood, that's kind of like start to finish now for me. I ideate on there and then I, um, you know, it helps me so much to like work in proportions and stuff because, and I think, I think a lot of art is just kind of evolving in that way. Illustration mm -hmm. stuff. It's like people are, are finally coming around to, to working digitally. Um, and you know, and then, so, so basically my process, I'll draw something out really small on my mm -hmm. iPad and then, um, I have a uh, projector and I'll use the projector to, and now I have this really cool projector where I can go wirelessly from my iPad to the oh, projector really? wow, that's and then cool. it will blow it up on the wall. And then I usually select my wood. I'll rotate it so that I make sure, you know, like if there's any knots or anything, maybe I want that mm -hmm. to be in a specific spot. Um, or maybe like the grain's really dramatic in this certain area. And I want that to kind of like, you know kind of end up in like the head area or, or whatever yeah um so then i'll just uh pencil it in based off of my projection and then i cut them out mm -hmm. and usually i try to kind of like if i've got several commissions going on at a time i'll try to to link different parts of the process together so i'm not constantly like running between my projector and my saw and everything right um and then the, the rest of it is just kind of like in it's just intuition i mean you just mm. kind of 
I've been doing it for so long now that I just dive into certain areas. And that's not to say I don't screw up like royally from time to time. <laughs> and then I have to, but the beautiful thing is when you're wood burning, you, the sander, you know, like an orbital sander is your eraser. Mm-hmm. So oh, if, really? you, if you screw up in an area, you can just wipe it clean and start from scratch. You know, huh. you wouldn't want to do that too many times or else you're going to end up with a big divot there, you know, but right. the burn isn't going as deep as I think a lot of people assume that it would. Mm-hmm. Um, so then, yeah. So then I, I finish my burn. I usually go in kind of get all the, the shaded areas, the bigger, it's very similar to painting where you kind of start with like an underpainting or like kind of work your way forward. Mm-hmm. And that's what I do. And then my last kind of phase uh, is, is going in with the, the, the wood burning pen. Um, mm-hmm. And I'll work on like the eyes and like really specific areas like that, that do require a little detail. Cause sometimes all you need is like a, a really detailed eye or something. And it just mm-hmm. pulls the whole piece together. Right. Um, and then after that, I go in with a Dremel okay. and I'll go in and do all my highlights and everything. So I'm actually removing, um, removing parts of it at that point. Huh. Um, and that'll give like some really cool little highlights. So you can get like the catch in the eye and you can get kind of like, you know, little highlights on the scales and stuff like that. So um, that pretty much brings the burning to a close and then i have a resin room uh which i just finished building out out here in colorado actually um it's fully insulated and oh I can, no way there it's it's a big upgrade for me yeah um and i can get with one little space heater i can get it up to like 70 degrees in there Holy and crap. There even in go. the middle yeah. of, even in the middle of the winter mm-hmm. and then uh i you know the resin process is a whole like art in itself i mean it's right. so it, when i first started it was so frustrating because i would get dirt and you know like a hair would land in it <laughs> you know in the middle of the night when i'm not around to monitor it and right um so having a dust free environment is really key um mm-hmm. and yeah that's pretty much it and then with my print mounts which is what you see behind me here mm-hmm. uh, those are actually my drawings uh in print form that, okay uh i you see, you, I, I mean, maybe if you cruise my website too, you'll see my smaller prints, which are just yeah. traditional prints that you can, you know, buy and put in a frame. And then I have um, these new print mounts, which I just started playing with like a month ago. Oh, and really? Those are pretty new. Very new. Yeah. Wow. So I'm basically creating large digital files of my original um, drawings and then mm-hmm. mounting those to wood and finishing them with with resin the exact same way so i'll have batches where you know i'm, I'm doing print mounts and then i've got burns on the table at the mm-hmm. same time um so yeah so you got like almost a lot a little, going on it sounds like it and i love how i love how hands-on it really is because i think a lot of people think art is you know pen and paper or or maybe it's dig- you know a lot of people nowadays are graphic design but you kind of take all of these modalities and really combine them right like you're talking about a saw and orbital sander. Like now you start to sound like a carpenter, right? And then you're talking about resin and and making sure that it's a dust free environment. And you're almost kind of sounding like you're a boat builder, right? Or a surfboard shaper. But at the same time, you're, you're, you kind of combine your, your love for the ocean with all of these trades that kind of revolve around the water, you know, to some extent, right? Like you're using the same tools that a surfboard shaper would, or a boat builder would, or someone that isn't necessarily considered an artist. Although I kind of would argue against that. I think if you're a surfboard shaper, Definitely they are, yeah. you're an artist of some form, right? If even a carpenter, 100%. right? Um, or a boat builder. So I like how you kind of take all those modalities and, and really combine them. So w- was there a time where, you know, going through this process and not really being an artist, but kind of wondering is there there is there a moment where you're like oh man i don't think this process is going to work like when you start to develop this the like for instance the 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 new print with the you know the prints behind you that you were talking about yeah yep what kind of drives you to say all right well let's try this you know let's let's dabble in this and oh this doesn't work so let me let me switch things up like what kind of challenges were you dealing with 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 some of these things yeah i mean i think um 
I don't know. I think there's still kind of like almost like a stigma around um, digital digital art sometimes. I think people mm. just, you know, think like, you know, that it isn't as handmade, you know, but it mm-hmm. is like it's kind of just a new medium. And mm-hmm. I I love all the flexibility. Like I love being able to, you know, move backwards and forwards and like you know it it honestly allows your mind to like explore new uh ideas in, in a different way than you could yeah. just uh with pen and paper uh, and i was doing these prints and i kind of ran into that same scale issue that i was talking about with the wood burning i mm-hmm. you know i'm doing these prints which i love make i love doing the prints arguably just you know just as much as the the wood burns um mm-hmm. And I kind of just, yeah, the same thing. I mean, I'm looking at, you know, a, a tarpon that's, you know, maybe a foot long. And then it's the same kind of, I was having the same feeling like, well, what if I could, what if I could blow these up and like, mm-hmm. make, you know, and, and it's, it's caused me, I did run into a lot of issues with resolution and stuff like that. Cause I'm doing mm-hmm. all my printing in house as well, right. which is, a, is, you know, one of the big takeaways from going to school for design, it's like you work with printers a lot. So um, revisiting a lot of that stuff and kind of just trying to get all of that dialed so that you still get that really crisp image, even on a much mm-hmm. larger scale. So now all my files are just huge, like giant, <laughs> you know, giant. Your computer is chock full. It's hurting. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so that's been kind of it's its own challenge but it's really cool because like one day i'll spend out in my shop and i'm just wood burning and working with my hands exclusively like that's all Mm -hmm. i'm doing and then other days you know maybe it's i'm just not feeling as inspired in that way but i'm feeling really inspired uh working on my tablet and that's Mm -hmm. that's what i'll do and then the the other cool thing is when i travel you know i can if i've got a big airplane ride or whatever ahead of me it's just so cool to be able to just bust out the iPad and then I can be designing, you know, and, and yeah. that time isn't wasted. So, yeah. Um, well, I'll yeah. tell you what, you know, there's, there's something therapeutic about doing art, you know, and, and it was funny. I was just, I just flew back from Utah on Monday and one of my teammates, she's, she's an artist, right? She does her own, she makes signs and stuff. And she experimented, she's been experimenting with this thing where it's basically, she takes an image and then she outlines the people in the image, you know, and, it, and then she yeah. puts it on a background or something. And cool. I'm like, man, that's actually really, really cool. And so I was watching her do it and I'm like, and, uh, my other, my, my other teammate, my coach was watching her do it as well. So she's sitting in the middle on the middle aisle and we're just both like, looking down at her doing this. And I was like, man, this is more therapeutic for me than it is for you probably doing it or probably is equal to. Um, but as an artist, do you think, I mean, cause really you're, rep- you're, you're representing, you know, not only the art community, but also the fishing community and the commercial fishing community and conservation and all these different aspects of being a waterman. Right. Um, and passing along that therapeutic kind of, feeling to these people right what's been um like what's been your viewpoint on that you know and and how do you see yourself fitting into like the the um like the bigger picture here yeah i mean that's a really good question um i mean conservation is huge for me and like Mm -hmm. you know i think being a diver and a a spear fisherman and a rod and reel fisherman like I think there's a really responsible way to do it and a really Mm -hmm. irresponsible way to do it. And I was fortunately raised in a, you know, like with a very conservation focus and, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I try to, I try to bring that through my art too. You know, I, a lot of, I, I still am working on better ways that I can kind of, uh, I don't, I, I, I don't want to say like give back, but, you know, it was mm-hmm. interesting hearing, uh, you know, Corey with, you know, on uh, a few podcasts ago from Jetty, you know, he's a good buddy mm-hmm. of mine and, you know, all the ways that Jetty gives back, you know, and like the ways that they interact with the community. And um, that's definitely something that I'm trying to figure out my best avenue to do that. I do um, donate work a lot to mm-hmm. a lot of like, you know, um, fundraisers for conservation and different 
different conservation agencies and stuff. But I, I, you know, for me, I think the I I identify almost more as a as a, with the fishing community than I do with the art community. Uh, yeah, and I think that that's maybe just come from you know me my, my, most of my time in my life has been interacting with fishermen not interacting with other artists and mm. i appreciate other artists so much and i like i mean there's just so many talented artists out there and with social media i mean you see you just see yeah. the endless talent out there and it does inspire you you know and mm-hmm. but for me I, I mean part of the reason i wanted I, I started out just doing the wood burning and then I was like, you know, based on the time that I put into it and, you know, all, all the materials and everything, it's, you have to, you have to charge a certain (laughs) certain price for these things. And then it's, it was kind of a bummer to me that, sorry, I'm trying to get my little, uh, yeah, blocker here. Um, and it was kind of a bummer to me that so many people would reach out and like, it was so with so much enthusiasm and they would, Mm -hmm you know whether it be through instagram or email or or whatever and they'd be like hey i i really want a piece of your art Mm -hmm. and then they'd ask the price and then i dropped the price on them and some people you know they don't flinch right and you know they have that kind of disposable income and then there's other Mm -hmm. people who are passionate about fishing more so than like anybody i've ever met right but you know money's tight and like i don't Mm -hmm. want those people to be you know they, they want to support what I'm doing and they connect with something that I did, you know, on some level. And Mm -hmm. I want them to be able to, to have something in their, in their office or, you know, wherever. And then that's kind of one of the motivations for me to start doing my prints. It's Mm -hmm. just, it's something that's, they're open edition. So, you know, they're not as expensive for that reason. So open edition just, you know, just means there's, they're not, in a series essentially you know i I, right the people can buy them freely so i just have a lower price point and Mm -hmm. i want fishermen i want i want fish people i want everybody to have access i guess right it comes down to and um and yeah some of those are the most like kind of impactful uh you know sales i guess i have or to people that you know maybe they saved up for you know, several months, Mm -hmm. just, you know, stash just a little bit away to get, you know, to buy it or whatever. And right. Have you, have you come across, have you come across one in particular that kind of stands out to you? Um, you know, not necessarily. I do have, I do have this one guy in Connecticut that has been kind of curating his own little collection (laughs) over the, over the year. Like every year he buys a new, he buys a new print. Yeah, and uh, he sent me a photo of his wall with this. You know, it, every year it grows a little bit, mm-hmm. so that's been kind of cool to see. And uh, and then he'll he'll you know he'll he'll reach out via email and kind of like pick my brain about like what the new species you know like what right what's the next what one coming up yeah you know or what's coming out yeah I and mean, it's just cool yeah. to see somebody who's got that kind of like follow up drive. It's just it's right. neat. So. That must be a pretty cool feeling though, you know, from, from your perspective is like, you're really impacting him, but you're not only that, you know, you mentioned this whole, this whole access concept, right? Like providing access for people that might not have the money right away, you know, might not have, you know, but down the line they will, or, or providing them with a print that's at a little bit of a lower price point, you know, and in, in a lot of ways, that's kind of similar to the whole idea of, you know, the fishery, right. And conservation. And it's interesting to find that your dad was a commercial fisherman because I find there's this, there's this whole mindset of that commercial fishermen aren't conservationists. And I would argue completely against it because in reality they are right. Those are the people, those are the hunters of, of the forest, right. Of the ocean. So, um, and those are the people that created our national parks and pay for a lot of the access to, to public lands and hiking trails and what have you, right? All of that money mostly comes from hunters and fishermen, right? So when you go buy a fishing license, you're buying your right to access said resource, you know? Um, so, you know, I think that's really interesting that you want to provide someone that opportunity more so because 
you're really providing the same opportunity that they would to go step out onto a beach and, and cast a line out, right? And and see that fish come al- come alongside the boat and and be able to put it into a net and kind of study it for a little bit and then release it back into the water. So it's a very interesting concept. Do you think um, your dad being a commercial fisherman was a pretty big role into why you are more you you relate more towards the fishing community rather than the art community because your dad is also an artist too yeah and i would say he's moved kind of the other direction you know he he started out in, in that kind of commercial fishing um world but then once he became an artist he definitely kind of went for that like high higher i don't want to say high end but like he really moved into that kind of gallery space mm-hmm. um with his art and you know i I've had so many people over the years, especially with the wood burns, mm-hmm. including, you know, gallery owners and stuff kind of try to, um, you know, pull me in that direction, which I, I do to an extent, you know, I, mm-hmm. I am like, I do have a few galleries that represent my work, but then I just, I don't know the people I was interacting with on a day-to-day basis were, were were people that a lot of people who were struggling to get by, but they, you know, the the one thing you could, you could always depend on them doing with their free time was like going to fish the jetty with their surf casting rod, you know, on the weekend. And like, those are the people that I think they kind of get shoved out of the art market a little bit because there's no, like so much of the Marine artwork and artwork in general, it's just a really, it's a huge purchase, you know? And it's like, I, I, I really do love that. And it's the open edition thing. I mean, that that's, that's mm-hmm. what allows that to kind of happen because if it was, right. if I was doing limited edition, I would charge more and mm-hmm. rightfully uh, so kind of I mean, more exclusive, I guess. Um, yeah. But it's just kind of the path of, I've chosen to go and, you know, it presents its own challenges definitely from time to time, but, mm-hmm. um, yeah, but it's, cool it's, always it's always evolving. It's always evolving. Yeah, it's over. It's always evolving, like your artwork, right? I mean, you started out with these these burns, and then you're kind of moving into the prints, and then you're moving into the the stuff that we just talked about. You know, where someone can kind of get in on a on a more of a just an entry level, right? I guess you could say. Um, but what I really find is that you you stay true to your authenticity, you know, and you're in you not only that, but you also align yourself with brands like Jetty, you know, who was just recently on the show. Um, and I know that you guys have been doing a lot of work together and that's kind of how we got talking. Um, but it, it, there's something to be said about sticking true to yourself and being authentic. And that's exactly what Jetty does. Right. I mean, Corey is probably one of the most authentic dudes to, that I've spoken with. Right. I I mean, (laughs) he's he's just a great, he's just a great guy, you know, and I was honored to have him on the show just to, you know, grab a, an hour or so of his time. Um, but what is it? you know, what does that mean to you? You know, staying authentic to yourself and staying authentic to the art that you want to make rather than creating art for the market. And then also, how do you kind of, how are you going about finding people like Corey and Jetty? And why do you choose to work with them rather than going to, you know, a big expensive gallery? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, I guess kind of like the, the first part of that, um you know finding these people it's like you know Corey's a perfect example like we have a a mutual a mutual friend in the spearfishing community and Mm -hmm. I met Corey through spearfishing and diving and we you know since then have become you know he's been out here in Colorado on snowboard trips and stuff you know he's we've become really good friends and then you know Jetty's just so they've they've been around for so long and they've kind Mm -hmm. of grown so much it's you know even for an artist it's like a totally different kind of realm but there's so much for me to learn from you know from him and and from their company and and like i was saying about how they you know incorporate themselves into the community you know via these different kinds of uh, fundraising and kind of stuff Mm -hmm. like that it it's inspiring and i it's just really cool that, I mean, I've never had a relationship with, you know, I have, I do actually have one really good buddy who owns a gallery and it's kind of <laughs> like a, a very different, you know, 
vibe than most galleries but like most of my friends you know aren't gallery owners you know they're like people who are entrepreneur you know like trying to 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 do things like jetty you know like jetty Mm -hmm. is and then it's also they they walk the walk you know it's like uh Corey's out there all the time. I mean, he's right. he's surfing, he's, he's diving, on water. He's, yeah. he's on the water, and he lives that. You're right about authenticity. I mean, that guy, he's just, a, you know, he, he really lives it. So mm-hmm. those are the people that I want to align myself with. And like the jetty, the jetty thing for me was just a no brainer. And right. It's, it's just, it's the same community. It's the same, the same people who are wearing jetty are, you know, I would, you know, I hope or potentially are the same people <laughs> right. that it would connect with my work. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. No, I, you know, from what I've found, authenticity is key, right? Because it, it's, it, it's, you're either upfront about what you're trying to do and, and the, the value behind it and being true to yourself and, you know, and trying to just put something good out in the world that maybe isn't already out there. Right. But there's, there is only good intentions, right? With like a capital G good. There's not, I'm going to do something good and then make money off of it, right? It's, you have good intentions when you give someone a piece of art, right? Corey has good intentions when he sells someone a t-shirt, right? Because they give back and they've given back, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And for you, you know, you're giving back, you're giving someone a representation of what they love to do, right? You know, like if someone loves to go to togging, well, by God, maybe they want to have a cool to tog print in the back, you know, on their, in their office or over their mantle. Right. But that it's more than just having that piece of art. It's a representation of oneself, you know? And I think art is such a perfect way to do that because it encapsulates it in, into the artist's per- perspective. Right. And since you are a waterman, you, and you relate more towards fishermen, you're, you're doing it right. You're authentic. You know, it's, it's like, if I were to say, if I were to do this podcast and not be someone that's ever worked on the water, you know, it it just wouldn't work, you know, but because I work on the water and I am a captain, like it flows. Right. And, or at least I think so. I mean, hundred percent. I hope so. You are the guy to be doing this podcast. That's for sure. (laughs) Well, I appreciate that. But, you know, I think with, with everything that's going on, you know, in, you know, the balance between Colorado and Maine and and how you kind of approach art in general, you know, there's always this evolution, right? Like this evolution of, okay, I want to start doing burns, then I'm going to start doing prints. And, you know, where do you kind of see this, this growing? Like, where do you kind of see this going in the future for you? Yeah. I mean, I think, um, there's always going to be new, uh, different you know there's going to be a new process that i want to try or something you know it's actually like a you know something new like in a physical sense that i want to do mm-hmm. with my art but then there's also you know i i have this goal of creating and this is kind of back to that fishing community it's mm-hmm. I, I want to build this ultimate collection of fish and it's going to take me years to do it but i just know that every time and I know this just from people reaching out saying, Oh, you know, like, when's this species, you know, when are you going to mm-hmm. do this species or stuff like that? It's, it's, it's going to take a really long time, but every time that I, you know, come up with my interpretation of a new species, it all of a sudden like unlocks a whole new group of, of, of watermen, you know, like there's right. always, you know, I always think of uh, Tog is, is the perfect example of that. It's like, mm-hmm there's people and their biggest passion in life is fishing <laughs> for tog. And it's like to find artwork that depicts tog is a really hard thing to do. Honestly. It is. Like, and, and I realized that and I was like, man, tog are like my favorite fish. Yeah. You know, they're, they, I know, you know, I can get, get count them, you know, both hands, like how many people in my life personally are, you know, just so passionate about that one mm-hmm. fish and they're so underrepresented in every so way. Underrepresented. <laughs> and, you know, it's like striped bass. It's, there's just so many artists and that's like, and, and I've definitely mm-hmm. probably through burning and my prints, it's striped bass. It's like 10 to one. I mean, that's right. definitely the dominant species in the, the Northern part of the East coast, but, mm-hmm. um, 
yeah, Togger, for example. So now it's like, I've just got this endless list. I mean, I've got a list of like hundreds of species mm. and I'm always trying to reorder them and like figure out, you know, what, Which one's what next? I'm yeah. inspired to do next. And um, yeah, so I think for me, it's just kind of like expanding my collection. I just always, mm. I always want to just keep growing it. And um, what do you think that yeah. next one's going to be? Um, well, right now, um what do i have in the world I'm, well i've got a new for my prints i've got an update i'm, I'm kind of updating my bluefish i got a, a pretty fresh bluefish coming out which i'm excited mm-hmm. about um great way to describe that yeah. <laughs> a fresh bluefish coming in <laughs> fresh bluefish it's gotta be fresh we all know it's gotta that. be <laughs> um but uh yeah and then i got speckled trout i'm working on um and I got a, I've got several striped bass commissions. I mean, yeah, that's the funny. I'm sure thing. you get it's bombarded like, with those. It's the only. I mean, I always like secretly am hoping for a for something other than a striper to come through, but mm-hmm. it's hopeless. Everybody just wants you know, <laughs> stri- striped bass is and then you know stripers chasing a jig or stripers right. you know about to eat a mackerel or something. Um, yeah. But I love, I mean, I love, I'll always love burning bass. and. Um, yeah. I mean, it's one of those fish, right? That it's a, it's a perfect representation of the Northeast fishery, right? Yeah. It's, 100%. it's you know, despite, you know, I, I like, I love fishing for stripers, you know, like schoolies in the, in the spring, I work a lot during the summer, so I can hit them too hard, but then, you know, that fall run comes along and things slow down for me a little bit. So then it's, you know it's back to fishing for stripers and you know, I love Albie fishing too. That's always fun. But, um, yeah, you know, stripers are like, are kind of like the cod of, you know, of nowadays, right. Whereas cod was like that gold cod right above everyone's mantle back, you know, back in the day. I know my grandfather had one over his, um, is kind of now it seems to be the striped bass. Right. And I was talking to the guys from hook and gaff, Michael, and we yep. talked about this, this combination of like, all right, well, for you guys down in the South, you know, in the Southeast, it's the redfish, right? It's like yeah, the striped bass is the redfish of the Southeast as the, as the striped bass is for the Northeast. So it's kind of interesting to see that the, the differences in depending on where you are in the country and what fish represents this population of people, you know, like if you go to Alaska, well, it's probably going to be the salmon, right? Right. Um, you know, and if you go to Hawaii, it's probably the marlin, right? Because that's a huge cultural, you know, there's a lot of significance to that. So, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, I didn't really have anything, any question there, but I think that was just more of a <laughs> an analogy of the fisheries that we have. And it's kind of an interesting kind of a thought because, you know, there's, there's just like there are up underrepresented fisheries, there's these fish that people just don't talk about, right? Like, yeah. Hell, the and that's rock. also like a like I think that's also like an inshore versus offshore thing. I think like mm-hmm. offshore fish, and and I don't know if it's because there is kind of more like money in offshore fishing or what, but I do feel like offshore fish just get a lot more attention than these like right. coastal, um, you know, these coastal fish and um, and ground fish. I mean, it's just mm-hmm. that's really my. I, I definitely spend time you know offshore as well but like my whole childhood and most of my best memories are are inshore yeah Um, no same same here i 100 percent agree with that do you have a favorite fish to either do you have a favorite fish to to catch and do you have a favorite fish to go and make a piece off of um you know i think they're not one in the same that's for sure Although sea bass is definitely up there for both of them. I mean, I think for me, uh, tarpon are so fun to burn. Like they're just, Mm. their scales and every, I just love, I, I love tarpon and I wish that they were in the Northeast and not just down South. But, um, uh, so I would say like burning and and probably honestly, um, in terms of my digital work as well, I just, I just think tarpon are like the coolest, Mm. coolest looking fish. And then, um, for diving and spearing, it's probably black sea bass. Just because mm. I feel so good about 
removing some of them <laughs> from the ecosystem. I just think they're like right. they're they're voracious predators. You know, they're moving mm-hmm. north as as the water's warm. We're seeing more and more yep. of them up in Maine, and I kind of I see them as becoming a pretty big problem for the for the lobstering industry and um i mean i think i was mentioning to you but like you dive those the windmills off of block yeah, island the turbines. Right? yeah the wind turbines and it's it's like solid sea bass down there they're like out competing yeah. you know you get deep enough on those windmills and mm-hmm. all you see is sea bass, and it's because they're just i think they're just out competing everything around them um yeah they're like the vacuums and, of the seafloor yeah and, and but they taste amazing. They too, <laughs> and, they taste incredible. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, they're kind of like the ultimate northeast fish in my mind because you can feel good yeah. about about taking them, and um, they're beautiful. They're beautiful yeah, fish. They really are. Uh, Those dark blues and blacks, and you know, they they're really good looking fish. So yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's safe to say that maybe after this conversation, people can you know, manage to guess what my favorite fish would be <laughs> both to eat, catch and look at. <laughs> I mean, I also... that's definitely a close, you know, close second for me. If not number one, t- Tog is a special, special species a... for sure. Absolutely. I think for me, it's mostly, um, because every time I catch one, I laugh when I see it, you know, it's that's just, right. You can't not laugh at a dog. You cannot laugh at a dog. So on that note, uh, Dylan, man, it's been great to be able to touch base with you and talk about your art and just, you know, fishing and the Northeast and, you know, how it all kind of melds together. So where can people get in touch? Where can people buy a piece of artwork, check you out? What what can they do? Um, well, so, I mean, pretty much everything, uh, website, email, Instagram, Facebook, it's all just Bold Coast Burns. Um, okay. And you should be able to find me that way. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly active on, on all, all of them, I guess. Uh, probably Instagram is the best the best place, though. Um, and, uh, yeah, Jack, this has been oh. really special for me as well. I've really, uh, really been looking forward to this. So. Yeah, well, I'm glad because it was um... – it was a, it was awesome to have you on, you know, and I just appreciate you taking the time and, and, uh, being to talk about art, you know, I think that's something that not a lot of people get to see behind the lens, you know, is, is what goes into a piece, right? Like the, there's a lot of, you know, just from my experience of trying to work with a designer and graphic design and, and getting to build a brand, um, people just, they see it and they don't understand the the mentality behind it, you know, and I think it's super important to expose and at least give someone a, a little, little bit of a taste of, you know? So, yeah, well, I appreciate it. And I'm always, always pushing for more artists in the world. So <laughs> absolutely. Same here. Well, thank you, Dylan. And uh, yeah, just appreciate you coming on the show. Sounds good. Likewise. Thanks a lot, Zach. All right, man.